All right, Isaiah chapter nine, let's call this one the garden, drawing on a term that does not literally come out of the chapter this time, but hopefully will be an effective illustration, nevertheless. Anyway, this chapter is essentially drawing on that concept of two days, even though it's not gonna use the term days, this time it's gonna talk about times, breaking it up into the former time and the latter time, as verse one will read. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. As he will go on to talk about a great light in this passage that describes for us what is commonly known as a messianic prophecy of Christ himself. Going on in verse eight to say, or sorry, going on in verse six to say, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it, with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. A passage that I'm just gonna to pause to comment on now. Why? Because as we said in the Psalms, we call them like water. We said they can be technical in their effectiveness on an H2O level. They can be overwhelming like a flood in the way that they convict of sin. But sometimes they can just be like a drink of water to a thirsty person in a dry land. And that's what this verse hits me as understanding that it reminded me of the garden in the way that we are now in playoff basketball season, actually the finals. And Boston, the Boston Celtics are one of those teams in the finals. But back in the day, in the 80s and the 90s, Boston Garden was known to be a uniquely treacherous place for visiting teams, especially if you were either a rival or if you were there during playoff season. Oh, don't let you be a rival in playoff season. It was known for being especially hostile. So in life, understand that there are some people who don't get the option to play an occasional visiting game. Uh, from time to time, use the illustration, there are some people for whom most of their life feels like an away game. People who over time might have quite naturally learned to hunger and thirst for things like justice and righteousness. Similar to something we've said before, when in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so for those for whom life has begun to feel like a perpetual away game, and not just them, but for those who take it upon themselves to struggle with them, passages like this tend to preach themselves. Because to the degree they believe it's even possible, it's easy for them to... Feel relief and even get happy at the thought of a place that actually functions in justice and righteousness. As the rest of the chapter is going to describe the way in which God is going to actually make that possible as he is going to bring charges against Judah in the form of a charge and a response, essentially saying his anger is still up and his hand is outstretched still. Charge in verse nine, essentially being a nine and 10, those who say in pride and in arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen, but we will build with these dressed stones or we will build with dressed stones. Talking about the ways in which God has brought punishment to them already. But in defiance, they said, don't worry about that. We're just going to rebuild. God is going to say the response will be in verse 12. For all this, his anger has not turned away and his hand is outstretched still or his hand is stretched out still. Second charge coming in about verse 15, where he is going to say, or verses 15 and 16, those who guide the people have been leading them astray. And it's not just the leaders because verse 17 is going to describe the people by saying, for everyone is godless and an evildoer and every mouth speaks folly. The response, for all this, his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out. Still, going on to the third charge beginning about verse 18 actually seeming to lay out three charges in verse 18 describing the way that wickedness has become established in the land in verses 19 and 
20 the way. Once again, they are not connecting the dots between the fact that God's wrath is burning in the land already, but they're not connecting it to the things they've done to provoke his anger, not the least of which being the third charge in verse 21, the way in which they conspire against one another. Verse 21 reading, Manasseh devours Ephraim and Ephraim devours Manasseh. Together they are against Judah. The conclusion, for all this, his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. God through Isaiah removing all doubt about the kinds of things he is going to deal with before his Christ comes back to create an environment where nobody feels like they have to play a lifetime full of away games in the garden.